I love, there's that one simple line in that song that is this cry of asking God to awaken our city. To, to bring a revival into the city. And that, that concept of revival is to revive life, to bring people back to what is right and true and just. What we wanna do right now in this moment is, I'm, we're gonna pray in a moment and we wanna ask God just to, not to, to, to come into the place, it's his place, he's here. We wanna ask that God would, would awaken something in us to see him in a new way today. But what we wanna do as well is we wanna ask that God do the same thing for all the other churches meeting in our community rights right now. Because if there's going to be an awakening of the city, it has to come from the Holy Spirit and God's kingdom, not, not one building. It has to come from the church. The church is not the walls. The church is not just this group of believers right now. The church is the body of Christ. Those who stand in unity, one baptism, one faith, one God, and worship together. It doesn't matter if we worship differently in different music. It doesn't matter if we use lights and they don't. If they take communion every Sunday and we take it the first of every month. If, if they do small groups on Sunday morning and we do it throughout the week, it, it doesn't matter. We don't have to look the same, talk the same, vote the same to believe in the same God. But it takes that God through the power of His Son and the presence of His Holy Spirit to awaken us be. So I'm gonna pray. And I'm gonna first ask that God would open our eyes and heart to, to see Him in a new way this morning. And then I'm just gonna start praying over some churches that, that God has put on our heart within our community, friends of the house, friends of ours. Some of them are churches in the community, some are churches across the country and across the globe. And what I wanna ask that you do is while I pray, pray with me. If, if what your comfort level is, is just reaching an arm out in agreement, then do that. But you know other churches, most likely. Churches that maybe you've attended before, churches that you moved away from when you moved to Florida, or churches where, where you grew up and then now you are here. We still pray for them. And so as I pray, and I just want you to just open your heart and your, your, your mouth to, to, to speak what the Lord asks you to speak. And so if he puts a church on your heart, ask God to bless that church today. If he puts a community on your heart, ask God to move in a revival in that community. If it's a person, pray for that person. But this morning, we just wanna turn our gaze out and up. So Father, we ask that you would just move in a way this morning, that you would awaken something new in each and every one of us. That you would open our eyes to see where you are leading us, to see what you were trying to do through us in partnership with us. Father, we pray that you would awaken our spirit here at the Bridge Church, and we pray the same awakening across our community. And so, Father, we pray for those who we are in partnership with for the kingdom. We pray for Bayside Community Church. We pray for Pastor Randy. We pray for their community at each and every one of their campuses, that they would find favor in the community, Lord God, that people would walk in their doors looking for hope and freedom, and that they would find it because you are there that you would bless their efforts and their labor. We pray for West Brainton Baptist and, and First Nas, Father God. We pray for, for Peter and Paul of the Saints Church. We pray, Lord God, for, for First Paul Meadow, Lord God. We pray for Grace Community and Lakewood Ranch, Father God. We pray for all these communities around us, Grace and Tampa, Lord God, that you would just move in a mighty way through them that you would partner with their efforts as we ask you to partner in ours, and that together we would walk to see the Spirit of God awaken a revival in our community. Father, we pray for those churches that meet outside of our community and outside of our state. We pray for the Red Rock Church in Colorado, Discovery Church, Lord God, in Fort Collins, Colorado. We pray for, for the Rock Church in California, Lord God. We pray. Father God, for Simple Church, Lord God, in Louisiana and in Dallas. We pray, Lord God, for all these communities that come to our heart at this moment, Father. This is not about us seeing success so that we may boast within the walls of our church. It's about the kingdom of God awakening a revival in our country and across our globe. We pray for those in other countries who meet in private and in secrecy, out of fear for their life, that you would bless and honor them and that you would awaken a revival amidst the oppressed, Lord God. 
that you would be with those who are faithfully surrendering everything, their money, their lives, for the sake of seeing your kingdom and your gospel spread. Father, a revival must start with you. And so we open our hearts and our minds to receive from you today. Whatever word you have for us. We pray for that same encounter to take place in this moment in churches across the country and across the world, asking that you would bless their labor, that you would bring them a harvest, Lord, that people would come to know you through their partnership with you in the kingdom, that people would experience freedom and life change, that marriages would be saved, families uh, fixed, Lord God, and freedom found through addiction and pain because your spirit is alive within their communities. Father, we thank you. We rejoice in who you are and we ask that you speak a mighty word in our life today. Father, it's in your son's name that with a loud cry we say, amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. Come on. We know that God is moving this morning, not just in this building, but across our world. And so we are thankful for a mighty move of God, a move that only he can do as we look to partner with him. And so, well, but welcome this morning. We are glad that you are here at the Bridge Church with us. If we haven't gotten to meet, my name's Lucas Ashley, and I'm one of the pastors here at the Bridge Church. And if you're watching online with us, welcome. Uh, and we hope that while you're online, that you'll just engage with each other. That is community there. And we are thankful that we live in a day and age in where you can be physically separated, but emotionally together, even if it's through the online stream and service. So make sure you chime in on there. If you have prayer requests, let us know. If you're watching from out of state or out of city, or if you just can't make it physically today, just let us know so we know where you're watching from. And for everyone else in the room, good morning. How are we today? Come on. I love it. God is good. It's hot outside, but football is on TV, so we got something to be thankful for. Well, hey, this morning, um, we're excited as we kind of land the plane on our series called We Are the Bridge. And we're not excited because the series is over, but because we know that God's been doing something incredible just as far as bringing a clarity and a unity and a confidence um, within our body as, as, as we've walked through this. And, and really all that it was is we just, through conversations over the last couple of years, just said, you know, we, we just want to make sure that we are all clearly on the same page as to who God has called us the Bridge Church to be. We are called to be the church as a whole, but each an individual one, God calls us into unique purposes under his greater purpose. And at the Bridge Church, what we wanted to do was just take three weeks to ask three questions. And within those questions, we, we were hoping that God would just kind of reveal um, a reminder, if you will, as to just who he's called us to be. And so week one, we started by asking kind of that all-encompassing question of who are we? We know the name of our church, but who are we as a church? And what we discovered is that through the calling of God, we are partners at the Bridge Church. It's not about membership. It's not about ownership. It's not uh, about just attending. It's about partnering with God for the gospel and with each other. And this is what we do. We do nothing on our own accord. Everything good and great that comes through our life comes from God first. And we get to experience and be a part of these things through our generosity. Whether it's partnering in community, partnering in the, the sharing of the God's word and the gospel, or partnering through generosity as we give faithfully to God and he partners with our generosity to change lives in our community and across the world, we are partners. And we are partners for something bigger than ourselves. And as we partner in that mission to love people right where they are and lead them into a growing relationship with Jesus, The next question that we wanted to ask is, well, then what are we doing? And what we're doing is just following the Holy Spirit. And that sounds mystical and it sounds glamorous at times. And sometimes it can be confusing, but it's a beautiful thing because we are allowing the Holy Spirit to lead our church. And so the confidence we have is that whatever season we walk into and whatever season we are walking out of, we are being led by the Holy Spirit. It's not about what, I desire, or what Pastor Mark desires, or what our trustees desire, what we are doing is following what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do. And these questions work in tandem to lead us to our third and final one, which is, where are we going? If we know who we are and we know what we do, where are we going? Are we sitting stagnant and still waiting for something else to happen, or do we have something ahead of us? And we do. 
But as we dive into it this morning, it's not going to be as specific as maybe you're hoping, but I think it'll be more powerful than you expect. See, the question of where are we going, have you ever asked that question before? We've all asked that question. Maybe in our younger years when we, were, when we were single, for those of you who are married, the question of where are we going is something you ask relationally from time to time, right? Growing up, we called this the DTR. It's the define the relationship question. It's when you realize you've been dating for a while and you want to know what's going on here, all right? I like you. I think you like me. You're cute. I'm not. It's fine. Where's this going? Because you want to know. We ask this question at times when we were riding in a car, right? Have you ever asked this question like in an Uber? I have, and it's a weird thing. For those of you who like control, you're gonna ask this question because although you're paying them for the service of getting a ride, you're still following your map on your phone, right? And when they don't go the way you think is best, just tap them on the shoulder, excuse me, sir, ma'am, where are you going? (laughs) Just wanna make sure we're heading in the right direction here. Like, you didn't get the wrong address or anything because this isn't the right way. If you've had kids before, you've heard this question in the car. Where are we going? When will we get there? Are we there yet? (laughs) And it's just the pattern that's repeated. Where are we going? We've already told you where we're going. When will we get there? When we get there. Are we there yet? Is the car stopped? No. (laughs) So clearly we are not there. For some of us, the question of where are we going is because we like control and we want to know. But it's not always a control question. Sometimes the question of where are we going is just about clarity. Just want to make sure we're on the same page. I want to make sure that I know what I can do to help, what I can do to be a part of it, what I can do when we get there. So it's an important question for us to ask. To help us kind of see an answer, I want us to look at a passage in the book of Hebrews. And so if you have your Bible, you can open up to Hebrews. If you didn't bring a Bible, it'll be on the screen, or you can use one of the ones that's in the seat in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, take that as a gift. It's not theft. It is our gift to you. I will never charge you for stealing a Bible, okay? But take it, use it, grow closer to God through his word. But in Hebrews chapter 12 in particular, what we see is that the author of Hebrews is writing to the church. And he's writing for a specific reason, because this is kind of the beginning of the church. And as the church began, you had two major groups of people that made up the church. You had, you had the Jewish people who had been raised as Jews and under the Jewish law. And so for them, stepping out of the, the kind of legalism of the law and into grace that we know through Christianity was a difficult transition at times. And then you had another group in the church called the Gentiles. And essentially, this was anyone who was not a Jew, okay? That's essentially the easiest way to break it down. And so for the Gentiles, they came from all sorts of backgrounds. Some came from pagan worship and witchcraft and sorcery. Some came from from other religions and denominations. Some came just from pure unbelief as an atheist or an agnostic or whatever it might be. And you had this beautiful mix of people from different backgrounds now running on the same track. And it's the picture we still have today. Just show of hands, how many of you grew up in church? Like you went to church as a kid. How many of you, except for a funeral or a wedding, never stepped foot in a church until you were an adult? How many of you, this is your first, I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna do that. (laughs) Gotcha, no. Um, So we all come from these different backgrounds and we all have a different past. And what happens is in our journey as a Christian, There are moments when things get difficult or hard. And when things get difficult or hard, what is the temptation to do? It's to slide back into the positions that we came from. So for those who had been raised Jewish, when it got difficult, their temptation was to slide back to the legalism of the law and their Jewish uh, rights. For those who came from pagan or witchcraft or from a sense of unbelief, For them, when things got hard, it was just this draw to step back into that lifestyle. This is where the church was, was in a position of new and growth in which where people were struggling and being tempted with the concept of stepping back into the patterns of life they had come from. And because of that, the author of Hebrews writes just kind of some some concepts of how to stay fast and encouraging them to continue forward in their faith in Jesus. And within the moment of encouragement, as we're reading through that and God kind of drew our heart to this passage, we see an answer for us and our question of where are we going. 
In Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 1 and 2, the author says this. He says, therefore, and when you have time this week, go back and see what therefore is therefore. Okay, in chapter 11, you kind of read the, the, the kind of the hall of fame of the faithful. Okay, it's just this, this verse after verse of men and women who have gone before us and before the church at this point, men and women from the Old Testament and New Testament who proved faithful in their journey with God. And he's saying, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, since we are surrounded by all these people who have demonstrated what a faithful life can look like, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Verse two, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. When it comes to the question of where are we going, there, there's a, a, just kind of a cool little way that this answer pops out in here. He, he says in that verse one, he, he says two things. One, he tells them to, to run with endurance. In other words, keep going. Endurance isn't the beginning, it's the continuation of something. And he says, run the race set before you. The, the thing to know here is that he wasn't calling them to something new. He was calling them to continue down something they were already on. What I love about that is what that revealed to us is just the confident reminder that the question of where are we going as a church is answered by two words, faithfully forward. Where we are going is faithfully forward. The reason this is important is because there's seasons of transition. Next week, we're going to share where God has led us in, our, in the design of a new building um, to add on to this property, to put everything under one roof. And we're going to get to share that with you and where God has led us next week. And we're excited about that. And so there's change. We talked about transitions between myself and Pastor Mark for the future last week. And we're excited about everything God has. And when we change and when we see change happening, we freak out because we think everything we know and love is going away. But the thing to remember is where we are going as a church is just faithfully forward. The reason I say it like that is because you need to understand that sometimes a season, a new season is just about a renewed vision. It doesn't mean that we have a new direction, just a renewed passion for our direction. A season doesn't have to be about change. Our season is about continuing. It's not about us changing everything. We believe that we are right where we are supposed to be as a church, that we are on the trajectory we're supposed to be on, that we have the mission we are supposed to have, that this mission to love people right where they are, no matter what season of life and battle they're going through, so that we might lead them into a growing relationship with Christ. That mission is not changing. God might reveal things of how we do it differently or opportunities to do it differently and in new areas, but what we do is not changing. We are partners. We are following the Holy Spirit into every direction he's leading us, and by doing so, we celebrate the new by honoring the old because we're just faithfully moving forward. <laughs> we're just advancing in the mission that God has for us. But the faithful part is the trick. Because if we're going to follow God forward, it has to be in faith. And here's what I mean by that. What is faith? It's the confidence of things hoped for but yet not seen, right? Faith is this confidence that what lies ahead, even though I cannot see it, is real. And so because of that, you must remember, for all my control freaks... There must be a mark of mystery with faith. If you have it all figured out, guess what it's not? Faith. <laughs> if you got the whole plan figured out and it's gonna go just like you determined, it ain't faith, it's your control. That's not what we're called to. That's uncomfortable for me. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like surprises. I don't like not knowing. I don't like not planning. I like to be in control of things. Why? I don't know because I mess up everything I'm in control of. I'm working on this with the Lord. 
But there is a measure of that that I want. To move faithfully forward means that our faith must come first. Consider it like a GPS. Everybody use GPSs from time to time? Whether it's Google or iPhone maps, some of you still use Garmin and TomTom, like there's someone in the room that still prints off directions from MapQuest, like we exist, right? Like, I always just wonder, like, you think texting and driving is dangerous? I remember my parents pulling out that big five by five foot map while they're driving. Like, that blocks the whole daggone windshield. Like, <laughs> but yet we have to look at things to understand where we're going. But here's what's crazy about using GPS, right? Like, the amount of initial faith we give that little device is incredible. Because we can type in an address to somewhere we've never been or seen before and just blindly follow her directions. And 1.2 miles continues straight for 500 miles. I don't understand that one. Just let me go straight. But we just get in, we type in the address, and then we listen. And we just go with no thought or worry or fear about if we get to the right place or not. Even if we've never been there before, it doesn't matter as long as we know where to go next. This is walking with faith. There is a mark of mystery to it. We have to understand that if we are faithfully moving forward, then that means that even though we can't physically see what's ahead, we can faithfully believe in what is coming. We may not physically understand how everything is going to happen over the next decade, but we believe faithfully that God is in control of it. And that if we faithfully move forward, he has a beautiful plan that he's going to unfold. And so we walk when he says walk, we turn when he says turn, we stop when he says stop. Sometimes he puts big road signs in front of our face to get us to stop because we're not listening because the radio's on and he tries to get our attention. But we're moving faithfully forward. But how do we do that? It's, it's one of those things that's easy to talk about in the church of walk by faith, not by sight. But how do we continue to move faithfully forward? They were struggling with it. And so the author of Hebrews gives them some help. There's, there's three perspectives, three things that he tells them to do. The first one is this. He tells you to look behind you. If we want to faithfully move forward, we have to start by looking behind you. Now understand this, when we say look behind you, I'm not talking about at your past. I'm talking about at the people that have gone before you. Moving forward faithfully into the unknown is not about revisiting your past, it's about seeing the measure of faith of those who have gone before you. This is why he starts this whole passage by saying, therefore, in light of everyone we just talked about in Hebrews 11, Abraham and Moses, Deborah, Esther, Ruth, Jacob, everyone, in view of them and the faithfulness they demonstrated, because we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us run. (laughs) See, when we look at the people behind us, it it provides something that we didn't even know we needed. And so that's the thing. If you're going to start by looking behind you, start by looking to the people. Start by looking to the people. Look at the people that are behind you. Those who have gone before you. Those people give us confidence. It's the whole idea of someone has to be first, right? Was anybody in the room the crazy friend who was always willing to be the first? So there's a few of you are like, yeah, you got some broken bones to prove it, right? Like everybody's got that crazy friend who's willing to be the first one to jump off the bridge into the river and see how deep the water is, right? That was not me, but I loved having those people. There is something needed about having someone go first because once we see them do it, it either tells us not to or it tells us that it's possible. When we see someone jump first and they are okay, it gives us the confidence to know that we can be okay too. 
The reason we start by looking behind us is because we need confidence to move forward. We need confidence that what we're headed into, we can make through. And I always love to look at those people in Hebrews 11 because it's easy for us to just kind of disregard our own life. Of, but pastor, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've done. Well, I know what David did. <laughs> David slept with a married woman, got her pregnant, and had her husband killed. Is that your story? <laughs> now, you might have stolen a pack of gum when you were a kid, but this is different. But yet David through a, a, a process of being restored by the grace of God, is mentioned as a man after God's own heart. Paul, whose initial aspect of his life was sent to kill and remove the name of Jesus from the history books. And on his way, with the legal document giving him the right to arrest everyone who spoke the name of Jesus, he met Jesus and was later arrested for speaking the name of Jesus. We look at these stories because they show us that we can confidently, faithfully move forward because we can see victory. Everybody has to have a first. For some of you, you were the first in your family. For some of you, you broke down barriers in your family. You, you broke down and removed those family curses and crutches. For some of you, you were the first person in your family to go to college. And that broke a barrier. For some of you, you were the first person in your family to not have an addiction to alcohol or to drugs. For some of you, you're the first couple in your family to not get a divorce. For some of you, you're the first person in your family to have a relationship with Jesus. To step out of whatever false religion or false doctrine you were raised with and step into a relationship with Jesus. For some of you, you were the first. And because you went first, Behind you, you leave breadcrumbs of confidence for everyone who comes after you. If we want to move faithfully forward, it starts by looking at those who have gone before us. This is what we do as a church. We talk about this. We honor those who have gone before us in order to celebrate what's ahead of us. So we honor. I honor and constantly look to a man like Pastor Mark and his wife Maria because of the faith that they have led the church with for the last 20 years and to see what has happened. We faithfully honor the men and women who met on wood benches on this property before buildings were built. We faithfully honor the memory of those who gave financially and gave their money to build this building because now we get to worship in walls that were built on their sacrifice and their faith. The stones that, that, that encompass the stage have names written on it of people who were prayed for and they were put up there by people who were asking God in faith to move. There are names on the floors underneath where you're sitting of people who have been prayed for, scriptures that have been prayed over you. If we want to faithfully move forward, we need the confidence that comes from those who went before us. But then we need the strength of those who surround us. I, I, I love that his verbiage is that we are surrounded by. Because I don't think he's just talking about those who have gone before us. I think he's also talking about those who are going with us. There is a confidence we find from those who paved the way, but there is a strength we find in the community that surrounds us. We need that. I love with our kids, they're in a season of life to where we are very little help to them at times. Particularly when it comes to math, okay? Our kids are in school. And they're both a whole lot smarter than we were. We were not academic types. We liked social and I liked sleep. And so we are already at a disadvantage. And so they'll come home and it's immediately, mom, dad, I need help. So we call our good friend Google. We figure it out. We pretend like we knew how to do it all along and we look really smart. But what actually happens most of the time is that they ask for help. We go over to the table, we read through the problem, and then on their own, they solve the problem. And we're left there thinking like, I'm just a, I'm, I'm an object, like, <laughs> I'm just a prop here. And we remind them at times, listen, we didn't do anything to actually help you, but I know what it is. 
That there is a confidence and a courage that comes from knowing you're not alone in it. Even though we can't actually give them the answers for it, I think them just knowing that we're there with them while they fight through it helps them find the answer for it. Sometimes the community we're surrounded with is not about people having the answers we need. It's just knowing we're not suffering alone. Everybody in the church in Hebrews was struggling together. This is why I love the author never says you or y'all if he was from Texas. He says we and us. He doesn't speak as some dictator or overseer. He speaks as a pastor looking at his people saying, we are surrounded by witnesses. Let us run the race. Not you go do the deed and I'll sit here. No, let us move forward faithfully together. We are here together. We are surrounded by each other together because together is where we are stronger because we need that support of community surrounding us. This is why we believe in small groups. This is why we do student ministry. This is why we do kids ministry. I love seeing kids in the room. They don't need to be in here. They need to be in their rooms because of community, because of what Shelly and her team and Holly and them do to create in that environment is a place where they can be met where they are and taught at their level of how to walk through a life of faith at their age. Our church is a church where we embrace those generations. And you'll see young generations serve. 80% of our our tech team at the moment are teenagers. And I love it. Love it. Because they're not the church tomorrow. They are part of the church today. And if we want to see God move in a mighty way, he's got to move through every generation in this building. And there's a support that comes in and knowing that they're not alone, we're not alone. There's a support that comes in being a part of a small group. There's a support that comes in walking through life with people. We are the Bridge Church, not because we are individuals, but because we are together. So we, we find the confidence to move forward by looking behind us. We look at people. But then there's, there's another measure of confidence and encouragement that we receive by looking behind us. He talks about that in verse 2. He says, we do this, we run the race set before us. How? By keeping our eyes on who? Come on, this is the one time you get to say the church answer. It's Jesus. How do we move forward? He says, by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. In other words, he is the champion, the victor. He is the one who initiates it. We cannot have faith without him. Because our faith is in him and what he's done for us in his death and resurrection, in his mighty works and deeds. That's where our faith is founded. He is the champion of it. He is the the, the initiator of it and he is the perfecter of it. He lived life so that we could live life. He died so that we would not have to. He perfects the faith that we are trying to follow. So we look to him. We keep our eyes on him. When Peter stepped out of the boat to walk on water, the reason that he didn't make it was because he took his eyes off of Jesus and got caught up on the storm surrounding him. If we want to make it further faithfully, we have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. How do we do that? We focus on the things that give him glory. We focus on loving each other well. We focus on living in community with each other. We focus on serving each other. We focus on giving. These are things of him. If we love each other and we love him well, we're connected to him. If we live life together in community, we are connected to him. Community is demonstrated from the very beginning. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is a community aspect within the Trinity. It's theological. It's in Scripture. We are not meant to stand alone. Even the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit don't stand alone. They stand together as one in the Trinity. (laughs) Community is what we're designed for. It's what we need. We're supposed to serve. Scripture says, even the Son of Man, Jesus himself, did not come to be served, but to die for those who needed that death. 
to serve other people. The night before his death, what did he do? He takes off his cloak, gets on his knees, and washes his disciples' stinky feet. This is what he does. His first miracle was service. Turned water to wine so that the party didn't stop. Like, this is what he did. He loved helping. He loved serving people. He loved living life with people. And he gave constantly. If we want to stay connected to and look at the Savior, then we focus our eyes on the things of the Savior. We love like him, we serve like him, we live like him, we give like him. If we want to move faithfully forward, it starts by looking behind us. Then it continues when you look within you. You have to look within you. You have to look within yourself. This is the spiritual health check. I I love, this is how he says it. In Hebrews 12, 1, he says, so since we're surrounded by this crowd of witnesses, people who have demonstrated a life of faith, let us strip off every weight, say weight, that slows us down, especially the sin, say sin, that so easily trips us up. It's like this. How many of you are admittedly overpackers? Like for you, the idea of a carry-on is non-existent, okay? Okay. Like when we travel, if we take a carry-on, it's because we know we're coming home with more than we left with. That is the only reason. There is no way that we are traveling out of town in like a carry-on bag. It's not happening. It's not, not, not possible. Oh, but you could do that. No, no, we do everything. We do packing everything. And we follow a process. We pack our suitcases, we weigh them, and then we unpack them because they're too heavy. <laughs> And so we understand that if we want to get where we're going, we're going to have to leave something behind because it's too much. If we are to move faithfully forward, we have to do a little spiritual health check and see if we are taking more than we need to take. And I love that the author, he distinguishes two things. He says there's two things that slow you down. There's sin, that's the obvious one. Doing things that are outside of the design and the will of God, which is sin, These things are obvious. We shouldn't have to spend much time on these. It doesn't mean they're easy to fix and correct, but largely they're obvious to know. The thing that we trip up on is not the sin, it's the weight. He says there is sin that so easily entangles us and trips us up, but there is weight that slows us down. When I realize the difference between these two, It changed everything for me in my walk with Jesus. And I hope that if you can see it, that it'll do the same. See, it's all about the question we need to ask. When it comes to the things in our life, and when it comes to looking at our life as we walk with Jesus, we can't just ask the question, is this wrong or right? We can't just look at it from a, is this sin or is this not sin perspective? We start there, we ask for forgiveness, we repent, we lay it at the foot of the cross and we move forward. But if we wanna go further in our faith, it goes deeper than that. And so instead of just, is it right or wrong, ask these things. Is this in the way of a greater faith? Is this in the way of me having a greater love for people? Is this in the way of having a greater purity in my life, a greater courage than I live with, a greater humility that I walk with, a greater patience with those around me, a greater self-control with my actions? Don't just stop at, is it sin, but continue to the question of, is this helpful for me running? Or does this hinder my journey? There are some things that while they may not be sinful, they are hindering your life. This is where it gets difficult. Sin, we could just walk down the list because for everybody, sin is sin. But hindrance is not hindrance for everybody. And so I can't walk down a list of 30 hindrances that you need to remove from your life because your hindrance may not be my hindrance and mine may not be yours. Social media is an easy example. For you, social media might be a great tool to stay connected for people. But for me, it might be a dangerous trap that makes me live my life in comparison to other people. 
It makes me miss the beauty of what God's given me and all I see is what I don't have because I see their fake perfect life that they've posted on Instagram after 30 tries. It, it, it might be a comparison that my life can't handle. And so it's a weight slowing me down that I need to stop. For some of you, you can have a glass of wine with dinner. Some of you can't. There is sin. Sin is sin for everyone. Then there is weight. Weight is individual. Sin is universal. The way that we discern it is prayer. Psalm 139 is my favorite verse in scripture. I pray it every week before I preach. I pray it pretty much every day before I, when I wake up. David writes and says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Then point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. It's not just sin. He says anything that offends you, anything that is hindering me walking faithfully further with you, I don't want it. This is the difference between top-level athletes and beer league softball, okay? It is people who have sacrificed everything to go as far as possible with that discipline. There's a distinction between those who walk further in their faith than others. It's not always sin. It's weight. Am I willing to allow God to search my heart in a way that when he reveals things, I don't look for a way to justify the reason they need to stay, but I willingly lay them down so that I can faithfully walk forward with him. We have to look within. And then the last thing is you have to look ahead of you. You have to look behind you. There's courage, there's confidence, there's clarity in those who have faithfully gone before you and are around you. You have to look within, check the health of your heart. What is the sin that needs to be let down and forgiven? What is the weight that needs to be let go of so you can run freely? And then you have to look ahead of you. This is about perspective. This is what I've never seen in this passage before. I always stop there, and I'm like, those are so good. Maybe going to verse 3, it's fantastic. But you finish the thought in verses 12 and 13. And this is what the author says. Is he's encouraging people to continue forward. He says, so take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. He acknowledges that we are beaten up. <laughs> He acknowledges that the journey is difficult. But he says, take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak, weak knees. Why? Verse 13, so that you could mark out a straight path for your feet. So that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong. There's two quick things and I'm off the platform. One, there is a cry for resolve in this verse. Remember, a new season doesn't require a new direction, but it does require a new determination. He doesn't tell them to grip a new thing. He just tells them to have a new grip. There is a new resolve and a newfound passion about the mission and vision God has for our church. We're not changing the direction we're going, but we need to strengthen our grip on it as we go forward. It's about a new resolve, but it's also a cry for perspective. Has anybody ever gone hiking? Did you clear the trail? No. Everybody drive here today? Did you make the road? Did you build the bridge that got you across the island? No, but it's a whole lot easier now that it's done, right? Someone did. Someone paved the way for you to get where you are today, and now it's our turn to do the same for those coming behind us. He says, take a new grip. Strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Why? So that those who are weak and lame may not stumble, but find strength. The path won't be flat for you. 
but it will be for those who come behind you. The fight you have for your marriage today is not easy, but it will show your children and your grandchildren that a healthy marriage is possible. The fight for financial freedom is not an easy one, but as you clear the path, you set up the next generation for success. As we step into a time where we are diving deep into our faithfulness and generosity because we know God wants to build something from his love, beautiful, guess what? We're not building it for us. We're building it for those who come behind us. We stand on the shoulders of those who have faithfully gone forward before us. And we faithfully move forward so that those who come behind us can stand on ours. Every generation has their move. Every generation has their call of sacrifice. The question is, will you faithfully move forward or will you slide back and stand still? What I wanna do is we're gonna stand and just worship. And I want our worship just to kind of be our clothes. You can stand. And what I want you to do while you worship is just ask God one thing. I, I want you just to open your heart to God and just, just, just willingly ask God, search me. Show me the sin or the weight that is hindering me from faithfully moving forward with you. Faithfully in my marriage, faithfully in my finances, faithfully in community, faithfully in making a difference by serving, faithfully in my generosity, faithfully in my walk of knowing God and diving into his word and studying his word and opening my heart through prayer to the Holy Spirit. Where are you hindered in faithfully moving forward? If you will open it up for God to reveal it, he will. You have to be faithful to release it. And then he will allow you to receive what he has next for you. So as we worship, ask God to reveal. But only if you're willing to release it so that you can receive what he has waiting for you. Because the call of where we are going is faithfully forward. We can't move forward if we're unhealthy and stagnant. We have to open our heart up for God to heal it so that we can move forward in him. This is my cry for myself. I know it's Pastor Mark's cry for his heart and his family, ours too, because we're going forward in whatever God has for us, because it's where he's calling us. And I don't want anything hindering me. So Father, we open our heart to you this morning as we worship and ask that you would just search us, that you would know us and that you would reveal what you find. If it is sin, I pray that we ask forgiveness and repent from it. If it's not sin, but it's something hindering us, I pray that we willingly release that to you. Maybe it's this battle we have of comparison or fear. Maybe it's something that is taking up too much of our time and resources and you're saying I have better for you. Maybe it's just this fear of stepping into community and that lack of community is hindering our growth. Whatever it is, I don't know for them, but you do. Father, as we worship, search us, know us, and lead us forward as we will faithfully follow you. Lord, we love you. And we worship you this morning. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us today. And if our ministry has been a source of encouragement for you, let me encourage you to do two things. Number one, share it with a friend who needs hope. That would make a big difference in their life. Secondly, share it with us. We would love to hear your story. You can send us an email at amen at bridgechurchfl.com. And finally, if you'd like to partner with us financially as we bring hope both locally and around the world, you can do that directly through our website, bridgechurchfl.com forward slash give. And thank you for letting us be a part of your spiritual journey.